Well, let's get started. Um, thank you, everybody. Happy October 3rd to all the participants. Um, it's 1230 on the East Coast, but we have a lot of participants across different time zones tuning into this Chemical Sciences Roundtable webinar on AI and scalability. Uh, this is the second in a series of three on this topic, on this AI-focused topic of webinars, and we'll conclude this series with a workshop in Washington, D.C. in February. Um, the next upcoming webinar will be on AI and limited data. It will be the planner. It's in the planning sessions right now with uh, Carlos, Gomez, Carlos Gonzalez and John Wild. And note and um, yeah, again, we'll have a workshop in February on this topic of AI and um, drug discovery along with robotics and automation. To follow the activities of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable and to join our email list, please use this QR code. Um, as this presentation is being recorded and will be made available online later, you can access these QR codes later at your convenience. So no rush right now. Um, a few housekeeping notes as we get started on this Zoom webinar. As I mentioned, it's being recorded. Only the cameras and microphones of the panelists and staff will be um, turned on and accessible, and please use the Q and A feature um, on the on the Zoom app um, to pro to um, pose questions that we'll get to later in the presentation. We'll try to answer as many as possible during the time we have. Um, so, a quick introduction. I'm Mike Janicki. I'm currently the director of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, Kay Wins is an excellent research assistant helping out with this roundtable, and Darlene Gross is working in the background, making us look good with the project management needs for this um, for this team. I'd like to uh, just quickly go over some of the members of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable, and they're shown here with Professors Marty Burke and Nikki Paul as the chairs. We note that there are members and ex officio members, with the ex officio members that are individuals of the roundtable based on their current roles, mostly in the US government. Having members from academia, industry, and government is a real strength of the Academy's roundtable, and we really appreciate the hard work and time these volunteers give to this um, program. Um, and none of these activities would be um, possible without the sponsorship from our um, two sponsors of uh, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy Office of Science. Um, one last item before we get started, there'll be a survey provided to the attendees after the webinar. Please take a little time to complete the survey for the team. Having your input will help us to improve our webinars and build from this um, webinar in the, in the near future. Uh, so getting started, um, the two planners for this, um, for this um, seminar, a webinar are Malad Abul Hassani from um, North Carolina State University and Patricia Hubbard from Cabot Corporation. Um, I'll introduce the moderator and then she, um, Melanie will start the um, start um, with uh, uh, the presentations. Um, Melanie Mesropian is the assistant editor for Chemical Engineering Progress, a publication of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Prior to her current position, she was a technical entities intern at AICHE and a research interned at NASA Ames. Melanie received her bachelor's in chemical engineering from the University of California, UCLA, uh, right down the street where I got my degree in uh, chemical engineering from uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, I'd like to note that she was an, helped edit the August issue of Chemical Engineering Progress. Um, that was a was an issue focused on AI and, and digit digit digitalization. Oh, that's a fun word to say. Um, so I highly encourage the attendees to read that issue. And I found a great quote in there from the editorial staff. This was not quoted to Melanie. Um, it, the, the issue starts off with one of my favorite movies growing up was Terminator 2, Judgment Day. For those unfamiliar with the Terminator movies, they centered on humankind's resistance to the rise of malevolent artificial intelligence entity known as Skynet. Some of the largest pushback against the burgeoning use of AI is prompted by such media portrayals. But the reality is AI has a long way to go before it can take over the world. So with that, um, I'm going to pass the mic to Melanie. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on AI plus scalability. As Mike mentioned, my name is Melanie Mestropian, and I am an assistant editor for CEP, the flagship tra trade publication of AICAG. And it is a great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar. So this episode of AI plus scalability seeks to explore efforts across the chemistry and chemical engineering enterprise that successfully employ AI to support the sustainable growth and development of the chemical industry, which all starts from the lab and scaled up. The chemical industry endeavors to apply AI tools to generate improved energy efficiency, reliability, selectivity, decreased environmental impacts, and safety in industrial chemical processes. AI tools have already been shown to improve processes for chemical engineering, but the potential in the digital revolution for the chemical industry is still unfolding even today. We have two industry experts joining us on this webinar today to discuss this area of expertise. We have Dr. Leo Chang from Dow Chemical and Greg Mulholland from Centrine Informatics. A little bit about our panelists. Leo Chang is a senior R&D digital fellow at Dow Core R&D. He has a broad research interest in emerging AI and data science approaches, and his ambition is to guide the industry to achieve AI at scale. Leo is on a mission to improve data acumen for workforce at all levels at Dow. He is proactive in working with universities to support data science education in chemical engineering and the broader STEM community. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2023, and Leo has a bachelor's degree from University of Wisconsin at Madison and master's and PhD degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, all in chemical engineering. Our next panelist, Greg Mulholland, is the founder and CEO of Citrine Informatics, the first artificial intelligence platform enabling the faster development and deployment of, of advanced materials and chemicals. He is an internationally recognized leader in materials technology, industrial AI, and digital transformation. Under his leadership, Citrine has partnered with some of the world's largest and most innovative companies to create greener, more affordable, and higher performing products. Greg serves as a board member, advises deep tech venture funds on investment strategies, and is frequently invited to lecture on AI and the business of AI at leading universities. He has been honored as technology pioneer at the World Economic Forum, won the Startup and Scale-Up Challenges at the World Materials Forum, and received over a dozen startup and business awards. He holds an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business, an MPhil in Materials Science from Cambridge University, and a Bachelor's in Electrical Engineering from NC State University. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to our panelists so that they can discuss a little bit more in depth their personal experiences within the chemical industries. Leo, why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah. Thank you, Melanie. I'm gonna give a brief introduction. How do I get involved with the whole uh, AI journey? And uh, the journey started when I was doing my PhD in uh, Illinois in the late 90s. So at the time, the term AI or data science or machine learning, data analytics wasn't popular. So my PhD research is centered around a term called chemometrics. Some of you may be familiar with the term. So chemo means uh, uh, chemistry, chemical engineering. So in the context of uh, chemical sciences, metrics mean math and statistics. So when you combine the two terms together, it means that uh, how do we uh, use math and statistics in a creative way based on the data we already collected a lot of time in historical database to generate uh, new insight in the chemical science domain. And, uh, but that, that, that's what I did for my PhD. And uh, so Dow hired me as a experiment because even uh, 23 years ago, that's when I joined Dow. And, and uh, so Dow already collect a lot of data in the lab, in manufacturing. So can we turn all this data from a more uh, reactive way to uh, look at the data when we need to uh, 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 make decisions versus can we turn it around to be more proactive to use uh, uh, AI to make a more informed decision. Um, so in the first few years when I started working in Dow, I really enjoyed the experience as a well-scale company, different uh, chemistry that we practice, different uh, plant that we operate in different regions, and a lot of the initial opportunities about like uh, in terms of process troubleshooting and uh, a lot of time in today's time, uh, some of you may have heard about the Gartner analytic maturity journey, right? As I look back, right, I did a lot of the work for the uh, descriptive and I think that meaning uh, that data has a voice and that 
have powerful visualization to understand what's the data you've been collecting, trying to uh, tell you. And we do a lot of uh, diagnostic analytics, analytic tests when we have uh, product quality issue or manufacturing uh, uh, productivity issue. How can we quickly pinpoint some of these issues and, and uh, help the plant go back to normal? So distributed diagnostic and, uh, 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 are very powerful tools that I use in the first few years of my company. And then I move on to uh, doing a lot of the predictive kind of uh, modeling, predictive analytics, so to speak. And how do we do a uh, build model to predict a lot of these uh, 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 performance indicator, whether it's related to customer performance, analytical tests, right? Today we talk about uh, forward modeling, I right? do a lot of these uh, to demonstrate value. So the initial proof of concept or Proof of success is really important to convince a company like doubt that there's a lot to be gained when we combine data and analytics to the our domain knowledge, right? So, so I was able to uh, uh, expand the capability because obviously the initial success bring on more project, right? Very quick realize that realize that we need a team of uh, people just with my skill set, with a chemical engineering domain, with a interest in AI and machine learning, they are some skill set and, and able to expand the capability hide the uh, one person at a time to to uh, 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 to embrace the uh, AI journey. So fast forward a little bit to uh, 2015, it's a really important uh, milestone uh, for me and for, for Dow and also for our industry. Think back to 2015, that's when uh, I should also mention for the initial uh, time in Dow, I focus a lot in terms of what kind of data I look at, right? Those are, uh, Primarily time series data, the uh, the lab experiment data, and and then the manufacturing data, the process data, temperature, pressure, composition. Those are the time series data. And then uh, if you look back in 2015, the data definition become expanding, right? So we what about the image data that we are getting? What about the text data that you see you get from your report? And what about all this email and 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 journal paper? What can we do with all this additional? data, right? And, and then the industry, uh, Internet of Things, we also have a lot of inexpensive sensor collecting additional data stream for us. And, and then that is also the time in the computer science domain that there are excitement in terms of machine learning development. Think about deep learning, reinforcement learning, what does it mean for our industry? And and, and then that this is also the time that the um, computer become more powerful and, and uh, hardware become more capable to demonstrate use these uh, 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 advances in the uh, deep learning and, and, and machine learning kind of technology. Right? That, that's where we, we have a lot of success in the company to demonstrate the prescriptive analytics, right? So largely about optimization, how do we optimize product, process, recipe, and how do we give them the uh, design outcome? How do we get there? And that's in terms of technology development, this is the time that uh, uh, we are hearing a lot of this uh, excitement in the technical field. So another piece of the uh, um, uh, uh, contribution is really important. This is dear to my heart about AICHG, right? AICHG also uh, asked me to uh, think about like, hey, we heard about um, um, big data and big data and analytics. What does it mean for chemical engineering? How can we take advantage of this uh, technology development that we are seeing in the computer science domain? Right? Do we have success story? How do we get the journey started? So uh, I have the uh, opportunity to get the uh, big data and then the next topical conference going in uh, AICC spring meeting uh, 2015. And, and that attract a very good uh, cost um, uh, audience from uh, industry, academic, and uh, solution provider to really have a conversation about what, what does that mean for the chemical engineering domain. And, and then uh, I see that uh, Melanie is the editor for uh, CEP, right? I still want, also want to show you this uh, special, uh, I don't know, can you see that special CEP? Uh, uh, back in 2016, this is a special issue about the big data and analytics, right? So I have the uh, opportunity to uh, serve as, a, as the guest editor to really communicate about like uh, uh, what do we mean by big data and analytics and, and how do we get started, what are the success story, what are the future research direction, right? So that's really important from a community standpoint. We are getting the support and curiosity for, for a, a chemical engineer to embrace in this conversation. So Mandy also, Talk about like my passion about um, uh, how do how do we um, upskill people right and how do we improve the data acumen for the company and in the uh, community and this is also within Dow in 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 our domain we see a lot of data scientists already starting to uh, show up in our company 
initial AMD first uh, data scientists that got hired, right? In 2015, we have many dozens of data scientists in different functions, different businesses. Most of them are in R&D and manufacturing, but we also have data scientists in uh, ISIT, commercial function, and, and many dozens of data scientists, right? So I have the opportunity to uh, to help form the uh, uh, computer practice for data scientists in DAO. And so we see this is really important for a company like DAO is well scale with a lot of different uh, uh, geography and different businesses and how do we come together to learn from each other. And so today actually, I mean, uh, uh, the community today, we grow to more than 900 people of uh, different background in data science in, in DAO. And today and yesterday, we were in a uh, internal DAO data science conference because we go into the community that we want to have a uh, more formal way for us to uh, talk about our work, talk about our challenge. And we have external speaker and, and we have very exciting kind of a uh, uh, program. So, uh, uh, so this is about like the, uh, uh, what we are doing in terms of DAO in our AI journey and in terms of uh, external to die also help with the uh, education about, like, I see the need that about while uh, we are getting a uh, student developed by undergrad and PhD in chemical engineering, and how do we incorporate the data science element uh, to the education kind of uh, domain. And, and uh, so this is something that I see the need back then that uh, 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 the AI journey is, is expanding and we need more chemical engineer with a deal domain skill set in terms of uh, AI. And this is another piece of the uh, important uh, milestone. So really fast forward to the journey about what's the AI journey today. When you think about AI, what comes to your mind, you probably immediately think about chat GPT from two years ago and last language model and generative AI. This is definitely a milestone in terms of the AI journey in the community. Also in terms of uh, uh, how do we uh, facing with this opportunity, what is our uh, uh, strategy to embrace the generative AI in our position, right? And, and uh, so this is back to the um, data science conference that we have today and yesterday, right? Actually, about half of the talk and post have some element about the usage of the LM or generative AI, talk about the opportunity that we are seeing. And, and uh, so just to give you a, a very high level kind of uh, summary. So, so this is my personal uh, uh, journey. So I'm gonna talk a little bit in terms of, uh, to me, what does AI at scale means? And this is something that I really have a lot of pressure in recent years to think about uh, for my entire 23 years of the uh, journey, what's coming for the next 10 to 15 years, how do we really achieve AI at scale? So AI at scale means that everybody Everyone in the company has a role to embrace AI, to use AI, to improve the way you do work, to be more productive. And if you are in R&D, you, you'll be able to uh, accelerate innovation faster. And if you are in manufacturing, you are able to use AI to improve uh, productivity and reliability. So everyone means that uh, R&D researcher, the operator uh, running the plant, the lab technologists who collect data when run the experiment, to the customer support uh, folks who uh, help our customer, to our senior executive who set a direction for the company. So everybody has a role to do that. So at scale is also means that when you as a uh, researcher and when you have successful demonstration of, of the latest and the greatest AI machine learning technology, you are very happy about what you are able to accomplish. At scale also means that you can also quickly uh, scale your project if you have a initial success in a product for a given plan. How can you quickly leverage your project success to the other product you make in the same plan? Or how can you take this uh, model success leverage to another sister plan you have in a different region? What about a similar product but different chemistry? Can you do that, right? It also means that uh, when you have a data science model that you develop, can somebody else uh, take over your model to support your model, uh, to making sure you can continue to generate the value. And for that to happen, you really touch on a really important point about uh, all this AI development, right? It's fueled by the data you have collected. And so this is also my personal experience about like, uh, how do we get a successful kind of AI project? How do we demonstrate success, right? And, and it's still the um, um, garbage in, garbage out, 
principle apply and and um, so if we have a way to really uh, uh, measure and improve your data quality and then this data will really help you to uh, really speed up the model development cycle when you are ready to scale up your uh, data science effort you will make it a lot faster and it also means that at the company level you really need to have a uh, capability and 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 then the holistic strategy and corporate vision right for for DAO our uh, digital DAO strategy is very simple it's a like one sentence sentence uh, statements about adopting digital capability to transform the way that we work so the way we work may be different from R&D to manufacturing to customer support to supply chain but in terms of the data we are collecting may be a little bit different but in terms of our discipline about like uh, how do we really invest in the uh, data foundation what kind of technology we should invest how do we learn from each other right so this is really the component about like how do we need to have the uh, uh, organization culture people perspective together and that's how we can achieve AI at scale thank you leo greg the floor is yours well it's a pleasure to be here, and I think my video will turn on in a moment. Here we are. Um, th thank you for for having me and, and Leo. It's a it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, you know, your your uh, I could not agree more with with what you've said, and and in some ways, my my history is is pretty similar. Um, you know, when when I started in the materials world, I come from a, a material science background. Um, I, I went and worked at a small semiconductor company in North Carolina. And uh, at that time, uh, you know, we were we were doing classic semiconductor experiments. Uh, none of them were cheap. None of them were quick. And every decision we made had really long term knock on effects for our organization. And we did our best with data analysis, but it ultimately ended up being, you know, a lot of Excel, um, you know, sometimes a, a, a marker and a clean room wipe in, in the lab. Um, and we weren't doing the level of systematic analysis that that I you know, given that I'd grown up with with computers in my hand, basically for all of my my educational experience, um, we weren't doing the level of analysis that that I thought should be possible. And it turns out, really, nobody was at that time, uh, especially not in in sort of broader chemistry. Pharmaceuticals have always been a little different uh, in terms of digitization. Um, but more than that, as I started to think a lot about what the the purpose of AI was, you know, I think Leo really nailed it, and that was enabling a new level of agility for the chemicals and materials companies in the United States and abroad. And, and the reason that we need to do that is that we more than ever now are, are in a very fast moving world. And I don't mean that in the, in the sort of saccharine way that, that a lot of times we, we hear that as a throwaway line. I, I think you all know that, that supply chains are changing very, very quickly. Uh, we have emergent regulation coming from both US authorities and, and those abroad um, that cause us to need to respond as an industry. We need to eliminate certain ingredients. Um, we need to improve uh, the decisions we make. We need to get products into market as fast as possible um, to satisfy our customer needs, to grow, but also to just have better products. Um, you know, I don't think we should forget that, you know, having better stuff, whether it's more sustainable or more performant or lower cost is really good for everyone, including the companies that make those products. And so uh, we when we, we set out to to start Citrine in 2012, we actually founded the company in 2013. And, uh, you know, I, I sometimes like to jokingly say we were doing generative AI before it was cool, uh, not of the large language model variety. And I can talk a little bit about that in a moment. But more in in terms of uh, the the other flavors of generative AI in in designing new molecules and materials. In my view, this use of AI in chemistry and talking about it in terms of scalability is a bit of a red herring, or at least it's it's a it's a it's a difficult enough change to make. But it's um, it's not out of line with the scientific history of our domain. Um, science has always been a data based discipline. Um, not always using databases uh, of the digital variety, but I think every person on the phone who's worked in a lab on the phone, look at me, uh, on Zoom, who's uh, who's worked in a lab has probably understood that you look at your historical data, you look at data you have access to, and then you work to to generate new data that either proves or disproves the hypothesis. This is not a new function. And yet the adoption of AI in our space is has been substantially stop and start for a lot of organizations. And 
I think there's a number of reasons for that, but I think culturally we are we should be well aligned to using data in our decision making process in an ever more aggressive way. Leo used the garbage in, garbage out mentality. And, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the best practices I've seen. So Citrine has been around for 11 years. Um, we probably worked with, I estimate, around 100 organizations, um, whether in a consulting capacity or as a software company in our more recent years, um, to help those, those companies adopt uh, AI best practice, adopt software. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of lessons we've learned that I'd be happy to share. The first is, it is true that if you have garbage data, uh, you will have garbage experience with AI. And garbage in, garbage out is true at its core. But the challenge is, I think sometimes we take the, the logic there a little too far. I've seen many companies go and say, well, if it's garbage in, garbage out, we must go get all of our data, clean it up, boil the ocean, make sure it's all good, and then we can start using AI. And that's a real challenge because what it means to have clean data or good data, and I'm intentionally using air quotes there, um, is, is really a, uh, it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Um, sometimes you need certain context, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you cannot go back and clean up data. Uh, if your organization has been around long enough and you have data from 1963 or 1975, where everyone who was involved in generating that data um, has retired, uh, it is likely that that data is never going to be rebuilt in such a way, or at least not for a low enough cost, um, that you could actually reuse that data. Because unfortunately, data is a, is a victim of its own context, and you need to really understand how that data was created. But even beyond that, there's some cultural barriers in the well, I guess to make, to make the point there, my advice is always identify high value projects, places where you think AI can, can play well and use that as your starting point. And then take what I, what I often think of as a TikTok mentality. Uh, you, you bring in data, you use the data. You bring in more data, you use the data. And you grow projects over time so that you're not just sort of betting it all on one big set of data and one big set of projects hoping that AI is going to pan out. It can work, it does work, um, but only if you're smart about it. The second piece is, is cultural. And I, I wanna to touch on two cultural aspects of using AI in the chemicals industry that I think are changing very quickly, but are extremely, extremely important. The first is this uh, interconnection among the simulation folks, the experiment folks, and the data science folks. When I was coming up in, in material science and chemistry, simulation was really, kind of in its early days. I mean, it was becoming big. You, you saw a lot more DFT research coming out, but by and large, that research was a DFT person doing DFT work, an MD person doing MD work, and a, a an experimentalist doing experimental work. Um, and data science was really not a thing at the time, not in a, in a meaningful standalone way. Uh, what, what I've seen is this desire to bring those simulation capabilities, which are really powerful, especially in some use cases, in contact more with the experimental world, because the downfall of any simulation technique is that it never actually manifests in a physical product being made. In a lot of ways, when Citrine started, our goal was to become the AI glue that helps connect these simulation techniques, which often take place at a much smaller length scale, uh, and connect those to experiment, which often take place at a more human length scale. Even microns uh, is, is sort of a more human length scale than oftentimes uh, these, these fundamental simulation techniques are used for. I was lucky because my co-founder had done his PhD in machine learning for materials specifically, but had a background in, in density functional theory. And so uh, I sometimes joked that Bryce, my co-founder and I were the first two people uh, from those backgrounds, experimentalist myself and, and a DFT guy uh, in him, uh, to work productively together and collaboratively together. Um, I know that's not true, but at the time it wasn't the common model. Now we're starting to see that and it's really powerful, but we need to take another step. And that step is to understand one another. It is finding scalability in AI is not about just understanding an experiment or understanding a DFT calculation or understanding an AI model, but it's working together to take deep expertise in each of these areas and collaboratively combine them to actually get to a, a meaningful outcome. Um, a lot of times there's, there's these, at least historically, these, these AI studies, these machine learning studies where you say, well, I can uh, go back and, and re-predict things that have been tested. And that's a nice way to demonstrate a technology. But the reality is the way we generate value and the way we get to actual scale funded within industry 
is by demonstrating commercial outcomes and industrial outcomes, not by creating a bunch of case studies looking at historical data generated between 2001 and 2009, or whatever that range might be. And so what does that mean? Well, it means a couple things. The first is we are going through a workforce transformation the like of which we have never seen in such a technical industry. The chemical engineering industry is an industry of people with incredibly deep expertise. The materials industry is people, if you're in aluminum, you speak a totally different language than anybody else in the chemicals or materials industry because it's just such a deep, deep area of, of importance and there's so much to know there. No one could possibly ever become a, an expert in every area of materials or even several areas of materials and chemistry. It's a, it's a real challenge. At the same time, what we're asking is for people who were experimentalists or theory experts or even data scientists to become interconnected across these cross-disciplinary areas. You know, how do you connect uh, data science with uh, materials? How do you connect theory with experiment? How do you connect theory with, with data science? There is there there are some people, uh, that, and these people are very smart and and very talented, but they're rare that have a deep expertise in all of those and are able to sit down and just think about that one problem uh, and connecting all those different domains and building a model and publishing that model. And and those people are are phenomenal. And and a lot of them are ac academia. There are some in industry. It's wonderful to see them do work because they blaze a trail for all of us. But. This webinar is about scalability and having these unicorn people that have this super hybrid high level of expertise is not a scalable solution for us as an industry. Instead, we need to have people who are deep in certain areas. And I've seen this dozens of times. I've seen this at, at many, many industrial companies where you have someone who's really deep in say adhesive formulation or molecular design for some, some particular application, OLEDs. You have someone who's deep in the chemistry of that, the chemical engineering of that process or, or the chemistry of the actual thing. And then you have, an, at a lighter level, that person becomes fluent in just some of the language of AI, machine learning, these sorts of things. And by the way, I, I tend to use AI and machine learning uh, a bit inter interchangeably, mostly because uh, there isn't broad consensus about the dividing line between them. And, and for the purposes of application, uh, the, it's, a, it's a distinction without a difference. I would go on to say that they then work closely with a data scientist or a theory expert who's able to be their partner in understanding how to, to roll out these models, how to grow these models, how to improve these models so that you actually can get both forward and inverse predictive power in, these, uh, in, in using these systems. And what that enables is you have that, that particular chemical engineering expert who now has worked with someone to learn a little bit about the model, to build these models, to use the models. Then the data scientist can go off and work on another project and become a resource, but an ad hoc resource to this person who can now gain leverage over their own domain using these, uh, these specific uh, sort of knowledge they have in their chemical engineering domain and while flexing this AI capability that they have. We've seen this work time and time again, and every time a company fails to scale, it is because they, we have failed to reach enough of those materials and, and chemicals uh, folks, the, the material scientists, the chemical engineers, the chemists, who might not uh, be able to adopt because they're afraid of it or because they don't have time or because of any number of things, don't feel the need to cross train in that way. And what that leads to is this, this gap. You only have a few experts then and, and they, they do not scale. And so when we talk about scalability, the cultural transformation of every chemical engineer, every material scientist, every chemist needs to have a grounding in at least the basics. You do not need to be an expert. You don't need to be a PhD, but you do need to understand words like feature. You do need to understand what models are good for and not good for, how to read a good model. Everything is not R squared. You need to understand kind of what, when you're using a model for a certain thing, what is it good for? The other thing that I think is is really interesting, and Leo really inspired me actually, uh, I, I, this is the first I've heard of the 900 person internal DAO conference, that, that scale is, is just unbelievable and, and one of the, the superpowers of an organization like DAO. Having more interest in this space is incredibly good. But we need to create structures within our organizations 
to help support people with interest in the space. Because it is very easy to convince yourself that you have done a tremendous job in AI, a tremendous job in data science, only to realize that you've fallen victim to one of the many traps in the space. Citrine's platform is, is intended to help people who have chemical engineering backgrounds do that without, uh, while still adhering to best practices. That's a big part of what we do, among a few other things. But it's also a um, it's also incumbent on organizations to help people understand that you know just because you had a model that checked out in theory does not mean it can be used and you shouldn't throw a ton of money at it. Um, it can't be used in a sort of a scalable way because it has some shortcomings. And so, teaching people the language of these things and how to think about these problems is really uh, is really important. And it is these sorts of internal conferences and academic and industry conferences that are are the, a really good place to do that to pressure test ideas and to discuss with experts in the field. The last thing I'd like to talk about is how we actually use these models to scale. Because one of the big problems that we run into, and, and it, it's revealed by the very next webinar uh, that, that the CSR is hosting, um, is limited data. So in our, in our domain, data isn't free. You know, when OpenAI goes and trains an LLM to go do all kinds of, of cool things with language, they can do that because they basically went and read the whole internet for free. And there are a lot of people who don't like that they did that, by the way, there's lawsuits outstanding. But in the chemicals and materials world, there isn't an internet of data. Academic data is sometimes under contextualized. Some, it's almost always outliers. Nobody publishes run of the mill results, unfortunately. And one of the things we run into in this, in this world is how do we work with limited data? Uh, because at your companies, you probably don't have 10 to the 20 rows of data. You probably have 10 to the 3 rows of data or 10 to the 5 rows of data if you're really, really lucky uh, at a company like Dow. So what do you do? Well, this is where that chemical engineering expertise comes in that's so, so important. Because you don't have enough data to train an LLM like, like OpenAI is doing. But you do have people who understand relationships in materials and chemistry. And so what you can do is bring together that that knowledge you have alongside the data to make a much more efficient model, one that doesn't dim the lights in Texas to train like OpenAI's models do, but one that is quite predictive in the world of chemistry. The last thing I'll say is on this topic of LLMs. If all of you are anything like me, and I have to assume, I've heard a lot of people have had this experience, ChatGPT launched in, in November of 2022, so we're almost to the two-year anniversary, it grew like wildfire. It was really, really cool to see all of that um, uh, innovation and, and the kinds of things we'll do. And I use ChatGPT most days now for something or other. With that said, I've also been a little bit disappointed because every time I thought it was really, really smart, it it is pretty smart. It does a pretty good job on some stuff. And that's, and that's great. And they get better and better. These new O1 models that were just uh, released are smarter than ever before. They're doing really, you know, they're kind of doing things that verge on reasoning if, if they're not quite there yet. With that said, they are imperfect. These have read a tremendous amount of, uh, of information. They're very broad. And so they're building a strong foundation and will provide interfaces for us and allow us to do new things with text because humans communicate via text and computers aren't so good at that historically. And so they open up a lot of doors to the kinds of things we can do. But what I do think is that we need more than just LLMs to, to be able to solve chemistry, so to speak. When you're looking for that next generation biodegradable plastic or that recycled material or that lighter weight alloy for an aerospace, uh, aerospace application or even a better battery, all of these areas are too complicated for the general knowledge that an LLM provides. So what we're seeing in the LLM world is there's a lot of peripheral interesting, very cool things you can do with LLMs, and, and we've done some internal demonstrations using them. They are not the only version of AI. Their LLMs, their foundation models, they're generative. They have a lot of really cool labels to them. But the reality is they're a conversation partner. And being able to plug them into other tools, being able to use them as a as sort of a supporter to your science is really the thing that, that they're going to be used for in the near term. And in my view, there are other flavors of AI that are going to be the things that drive forward the industry, both on the new product development side of things, which is what Citrine primarily does today, and on the quality assurance, quality control, plant management, operations side of things, where there are other companies and, and a lot of exciting things happening in that space as well. So there's a lot of 
uh, really, really interesting. Sorry, sorry, Mike. Uh, LLM is uh, large language models. Um, so we have a um, we uh, we have this uh, uh, you know opportunity to use all of these flavors of AI where they're appropriate. Which brings me back to uh, my original point, and and with this I will wrap up. This is about community building. It's about collaboration. We are beyond a point where one person can hold everything in their own heads. And honestly, we are beyond a point where one person, even an expert in machine learning, can keep up with everything that's happening in the space. This space is moving so quickly, and even the deepest experts in it are, do not know where it's going. They don't know whether superintelligence is a year away or whether it's never going to happen. They don't know whether chemistry is going to be solved. It, it's, it's a super, super challenging space because it's moving so quickly but it portends that all other industries are going to move quickly too. And so being able to crack the scalability problem in a methodical way is really important. I've been lucky to be part of it many, many times with different companies. Um, and I'm excited to share further lessons in the Q and A uh, with the folks here uh, on the line. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope uh, uh, to, to have a robust discussion for the rest of this webinar. Thank you, Greg. Wonderful to have both you and Leo here, and I look forward to a great discussion ahead of us. And with that, I'll get us started with our questions for today. So for the first question, what has been the impact of using AI in your experience? For example, has AI helped increase productivity and efficiency or management of resources, or has it improved safety? What are your thoughts? I, I can, I'm happy to, to, to go first. Um, so, so a little bit of all of those things. Um, what I will say is there is basically no company that has said, AI is speeding me up. I am going to uh, immediately slash all people to the ground. I think that's a common question I get, by the way, is like, well, is this going to replace you know chemical engineering jobs? And the reality is probably not in a meaningful way, especially not in the next five to 10 years. And the reason for that is almost every company, almost every academic group wants to go faster. So if your AI is letting you go faster, you're not going to just say, okay, well, we're going to remove the people and then go normal speed. It's no, how do I actually get into the world with these new products faster? Typically, just to get, put numbers on it, what we see is in the first year of using AI, we see a 50 to 70% reduction in the number of experiments you need to run to get to a particular outcome. So I have a target. If that number of experiments is going to be 10, it's now five uh, or six or seven. Um, and over time, once you get really good at using these AI tools, uh, we typically see a, roughly a 90% reduction at length of time. But that doesn't mean, uh, again, that the scientist is going anywhere. It means the scientist can get 10 times as much done, which is obviously great for everyone. Honestly, th that, uh, agree that, that sort of um, uh, speed to market benefit is what people focus on. In terms of, because that's that's where the real upside value is, mostly when we see folks talk about, uh, you know, productivity and efficiency, there's a discussion there. It's like, oh, well, we used fewer, uh, you know, fewer ingredients per, per recipe. But the reality is most people don't think about development that way. Most people think about it as I want to go get the upside that development leads to, and I want to do it with the best balance of cost, product, uh, costs, uh, sustainability, and performance. Um, and AI is very, very good at balancing those things uh, in a way that that really, humans really just naturally struggle to do. I, at least speaking for myself, I can hold like two ideas in my head at any time. Um, and to do those things, you've got to hold like 50 ideas in your head at any time. And computers are really good at helping us do that. Yeah, I really agree with what uh, Greg just mentioned about the human answer, and we see the productivity improvement was the role of the AI in our industry, right? So it's some, something I've been emphasizing internal to Dow and in the external kind of when it's about AI, it's not about replacing human. AI is really about assisting human to automate some of the tasks, maybe be more routine, and uh, augmenting human to make more informed decision better. That has been the definition of AI, but how can we make better informed decisions so that you can put your expertise the best that you should be, right? And so in terms of the question about like the, what kind of uh, uh, success story we've been seeing in the industry, uh, in, to the point about safety, productivity, and discovery, the, the answer is off the about, right? In terms of uh, safety, one of the points that I was very surprised uh, that the uh, uh, I'm able to uh, make an impact in AI during the pandemic, by the way, 
and specifically in the beginning of the pandemic of March of 2020, right? Everybody panicking about how what when will this thing gonna we go away, maybe in two months, things will be go away. Everybody work from home, right? Trying to learn how to we uh do things virtually and and now as a company of that scale, right? Obviously, we need to keep our plan running 247 and we need to keep our essential people in the plan, right? And and obviously call and call on essential people can work from home to support, right? And and then uh uh End of March, right? One of the senior leader sent me a paper about like uh, what kind of modeling approach they are support people are. I've been wondering about like how do we forecast about the pandemic and about the cases in different kind of uh, region. And I was asked to uh, lead a team of data scientists, data engineer, to quickly win make the uh, uh, their polls and then try to apply that uh, to our largest manufacturing site so that we can give a uh, forecast and guide guideline for people when it's just safe to. Uh, uh, send some of these uh, people back to the plant to the lab, right? Because like, uh, what's how do we measure and balance the risk versus the uh, productivity? Keep the keep the uh, keep the industry running, right? And and uh, so that that is something that as a trained data scientist with chemical engineering domain knowledge, we can quickly adapt to a completely different domain. How do we model diseases, right? We should I have no background, right? It's, but but then like what we learn about the uh, 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 ODE. All of, all of this uh, uh, um, systematic system engineering modeling uh, really taught us about how do we implement and when we have some of the initial data, how, how do we really uh, filter the data to really uh, 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 bring the uh, data different approach and uh, some of the fun more fundamental approach to, uh, to really enhance the safety. And so in terms of productivity, that's an everyday kind of productivity. In, in DAO, we are starting to launch the enterprise version of the uh, Copilot, and uh, so thousands of people today or they can use it in everyday work, right? And I uh, use it pretty much every day, and and uh, so as a simple measure of the productivity, uh, easily one hour, say, per day, in terms of like finding relevant information, summarizing email, right? Summarizing the meeting that you, you may have me say, what are the action item, right? So there are very key uh, productivity that scale across the uh, company. But in terms of productivity, that really dear in my heart, right? I spent half of my career in manufacturing, other half in R&D, right? In manufacturing, the concept is often called hidden plant. So uh, um, hidden plant means that uh, can you use AI and data science method to understand how do you improve productivity without really in investing in your capital investment, right? It can be run the plant better and, and more reliable, right? So that is the concept of hidden plant, right? So a lot of that I got, Look at yourself uh, when we have an increased demand in the product, every additional pound or well card that we can ship to our customer is additional profit, right? And a lot of time, because of the way we collect data in, a, in our manufacturing assets, right? We have a lot of historical data. Those, those are the few for us to do data science and AI, right? So the, the notion about like uh, a lot of time when we have the historical period where we are making good production, making really uh, 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 well oil machines go to speed, right? And, and which is some of the time that uh, you, you may have some reliability issue, what's the difference? And and then the the, the proactive measure is that how can you increase the likelihood that you can continue to, uh, to push the plant to be harder, what kind of uh, tool you can uh, give it to your operator and engineer to use, right? Those are really good opportunities to, 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 to the point that uh, Greg mentioned, right? When you have just a critical few population of the professional data scientists or unicorn, right? How can you deploy this skill set uh, to the relevant opportunity, right? So there are a lot of this kind of productivity opportunity in manufacturing. So in terms of discovery and in, in the R&D space, this is where we are seeing a lot of the uh, 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 faster to the uh, innovation and discovery, right? And, and uh, obviously it's a chain, obviously it's very, uh, it's the expertise in terms of uh, predictive formulation, both in the inverse and uh, 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 in uh, forward in your space, right? So this is something like uh, in the, before we embrace on the AI journey for discovery in the R&D space, right? a lot of time when you have a new request from your customer, whether this is because they want to lower the cost of their raw material or because they have a sustainability kind of requirement. And so your decade old chemist and uh, chemical engineer, material scientist, where you go to ask for the insight, how may I generate this new order? How do I generate generate this new sample to satisfy this new customer demand. And that is a very iterative kind of approach, right? Child and error to speed, right? And could take months and sometimes year to develop the uh, formulation or sample that you can make and send it to a customer, right? With the predictive kind of uh, digital platform, you can really streamline that uh, 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 insight generation, right? So those are three examples of the highlight. Awesome, thank you. 
Now, with the changes in digitalization of the industry and the implementation of AI, there must be some sort of a cultural shift. At what scale has this been at, and has there been any broad adoption with a big impact? Leo, maybe you could touch off on this since you mentioned data science education in universities. Yes. So the the answer about the culture, everybody has a, well, that's what we need in terms of AI at scale, right? Let's start with the uh, initial is many dozen of the uh, data scientists community, 2015 to over 900 today. This is exactly to the point about like, how do you, when you have the chemist, chemical engineer, material scientist, not classical between in data science, right? And how can we demonstrate that data science can improve the way they develop model and improve the way they can uh, generate data they need for their project? And that's is really the uh, recipe how we uh, uh, grow the community. And we obviously we also provide a lot of the uh, uh, training and support, right? And so to the point that I mentioned uh, to encourage and influence the chemical engineering department to start to teach data science, right? And we are able to uh, get some of our uh, people in the community to get a master degree or graduate certificate so that uh, even though they are not trained at data science, they have enough expertise coming back, they can be more relevant and do things faster in terms of their in their home group, right? And so in R&D, we have a uh, program called the CDS, Citizen Data Science Program, and that started a couple of years ago. And then the goal is to get everybody uh, at the essential level for every people in R&D, right? And, and uh, so for people that who have uh, uh, ambition to continue upskill, that's where we point them to the uh, data science community, to point them to some of these additional uh, structure kind of uh, training resource, both internal to DAO and external to DAO to pursue that kind of more, more professional career path, right? And, and then in terms of the uh, 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 really important piece of the uh, uh, puzzle and it's about the executive engagement, the senior leadership support, right? And I mentioned about the digital uh, DAO strategy. This is all the way coming from a C CEO and then the uh, chief information officer to lay the foundation to set the tone, right? And to the point our CEO actually is very supportive about the AI journey. And last year he organized a, uh, what we call AI Immersion Day. And this is a half day uh, section for top 200 senior executive of the company for half a day to uh, learn about AI and what it means for their own business and own function and point to some of these uh, self-paced um, learning curriculum that they took First, before uh, we recommend to the broader audience so that they understand the language back to the uh, people in the lab, people in the plant, and all the data scientists. And and, and uh, so a couple months ago, when our CEO went on the uh, Wall Street uh, for investor day, and and then the next day he summarized uh, about the investor day and talked about what is the key message. One of the key messages related to AI, right? So I write down that and because he put it down on the uh, on the LinkedIn, right? And you can check it out. He said, our operating discipline is supported by the strong digital foundation that is uh, complemented by more than two decades of uh, traditional AI deployment and the addition of generative AI. And when I saw that, I'm really happy. I have a smile in my face, right? Because two decades, what few challenges to the time I start to join down and so talk to you of some of these uh, initial success story to what we are doing uh, two years ago in terms of generative AI, right? Just to talk about the cultural change, right? And, and how do we really uh, drive a company of the size like DAO to really continue to achieve the AI scale kind of ambition? I'll just add one double down on something Leo said, because I, I, I agree with, with everything he said, but I also, uh, I think there's one that stands out in my view. It is not that, it's hard, but it's not that hard to convince someone in a, an R&D organization, whether it's big R, little d, or, or big D, little r, um, to adopt AI. Um, these are forward-thinking people who want to use every technology they possibly can to drive their products forward, right? There's a real sense of pride and expertise there, and learning new stuff is, is kind of one of the hallmarks of a great scientist, right? If you stop learning, you kind of stop being relevant. That is not that hard. Academics, industry, all the way around where we see these things falter and where, where the cultural shift needs to happen and be plugged into is at some business executive level. Sometimes that's the CEO or chief commercial officer, or chief procurement officer at a company. Other times it's a business unit head. But until there's someone who's, who's responsible for driving 
financial and commercial outcomes, especially of publicly traded companies that's engaged in driving this change, what we find is you'll get some scientists who adopt and they'll see nice results, but then they get distracted or they have something, you know, so, some other bigger priority come up and, and it doesn't become part of the sort of core thrust of the company. And the reality is, I don't think every chemical company needs to be an AI company today, but I think any company not using uh, machine learning or AI or advanced data analytics of some type in the next five to 10 years is probably at a significant disadvantage. Um, and if you don't start now, you're really going to be playing catch up in a fast moving industry, which is not something you ever want to do. So I, I think that business sponsorship cannot be overstated. Um, like I said, you can get away with it for a year or two um, by working with just researchers, but uh, and, and just researchers with great researchers who are doing great work. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't maintain that sort of business sustainability until you you start to really show an impact on the business itself. Interesting. So another big thing we always hear about with AI is security and ethics. How do you trust AI, especially in the sciences? And where is the trust or mistrust placed on the tool or on the data sets? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to start there. Um, the It's both. I mean, look, this is a new world. And the reality is the data sets, a lot of them are old or or haven't been collected with AI in mind simply because if you're doing work before 2010, you probably weren't thinking about AI, right? And and so I do not consider before 2010 old, um, but uh, it's it's getting further and further away by the minute. Um, so, so I think there should be a healthy skepticism towards historical data sets. Now, in the chemical sciences, in physics, in, in sort of the hard sciences broadly, we need to worry less about things like toxic bias. We're not doing facial recognition. We're not doing biology where like, you know, sort of personal characteristics would come into play in theory. And this is theory, but in theory, these AIs should be discovering fundamental physics in an unbiased way. And whatever bias is there should be rooted out over time by adding additional data because you're trying to discover natural laws. And so I worry less in the chemicals world about kind of the, the you know, sort of 1984 style dystopian future of, you know, your face was being recognized everywhere, you're being targeted all the time, you're being profiled. However, there are substantial risks in, in this space. I think we do a pretty good job of avoiding them as a culture, um, because right now what we do is we put the AI tool in the hands of a human and we say the human actually makes the ultimate decision. Over time, uh, if you've never heard the parable of the paperclip robot, you should probably look it up. Um, it turns out if you teach a robot to just generate as many paperclips as possible, they're going to destroy society because humans get in the way of making paperclips. If we create fully automated research pipelines, you want to make sure that those things aren't going after chemical weapons or biological weapons or, or have some sort of weird uh, return function that doesn't actually represent the desires of the companies and people. We're pretty far from that functionally today, and I think we have pretty good pretty good safeguards in place. Um, when If AI brings the demise of humanity, I do not think it's through chemistry robots, um, but uh, it's something, you know, we need to bring our professional ethics to the game in this, and uh, I think it comes at a lot of levels. It comes in data. It comes in the designers, the AI algorithms. We we do a good amount of work on this at Citrine. Um, and then and the, ultimately the operator. It turns out no number of, of uh, protections we could put in place. If somebody wants to go make something really bad, uh, create a really toxic thing, um, it's really hard for us to actually stop that because in general, we don't know what everybody's doing on our system. It's a private system. People use it. And, uh, and so there's, you know, at, at the end of the day, if you're if you're if you're at Dow and you want to create a super weapon, you probably could do it. Um, I don't think people at Dow want to do that. And so uh, I think it's you know sort of the professional ethics that have always been around in our industry need to continue to persist. Yeah, so in the um, uh, community, we use the term trustworthy AI or responsible AI to talk about how do we trust AI, what can we do to uh, mitigate the risk and what kind of guardrail we should set for our industry, right? And this is something that I start to work on uh, middle of last year because we see the need about as generative AI become more uh, broader adaptation. And uh, so what kind of user behavior, what, what is our responsibility as a user of the uh, AI tool? And also how do we hold the uh, vendor accountable for the tool that they are developing? And if you are the developer of some of this AI tool, what kind of um, uh, consideration you need to uh, really consider when before you deploy the AI model, right? Got back to the point about like if you have bias data coming in to change your AI model, your output 
of your AI model likely going to be biased as well, right? So there are a lot of scientific elements that uh, uh, in our community, we know that, right? But how do we translate to the term that uh, everybody in the company in the, or industry know about that? And, and early this year, Dow joined the uh, Responsible AI uh, uh, Consortium and or Responsible AI Institute as a member. And uh, so we are one of the first company in the chemical industry as a member of that consortium because we really need to leverage the learning from the uh, other company, other industry, and also uh, country by country. There are a lot of uh, AI framework that has been developed. Right? How can we pick the element that's relevant to our industry, right? So early this year, we developed the uh, uh, responsible AI principle. That's a five principle that's very uh, 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 grounded based on the uh, this kind of uh, responsible AI principle. But the core principle is really about human oversight or human in the loop, right? This is pretty easy to understand, right? Because all these AI model that uh, we've been using for decades or more recently for the generative AI or large language model. Uh, so the code from George Box described that really well, right? All model are wrong and some are useful. It just said the large language model is very powerful, and but it's not perfect. A lot of time make mistake, And when the two make mistake, who is there to detect that? How do you detect that quickly and mitigate the issue, right? How do you put some of these uh, use case, what is safe, low risk application, what are the high risk application, and how do you know that, right? And, and uh, so so this is some, 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 something that uh, I can relate to a uh, uh, personal example, right? I have three small kids, beautiful small kids, 10, 12, and 14 years old. And so what do they want to, go do at home, watching TV, right? watching Netflix and watching YouTube, right? And, and, and you know, there's a lot of AI tool behind YouTube and uh, Netflix, right? It's about recommendation of what you should be watching, right? And and if you think about that, if company like uh, Netflix and Google, are they doing responsible AI to really uh, put a guardrail about what recommendation for your kid, right? There are sufficient recommendations. So I would say the the recommendation most of the time is good, right? I would say 90% of the time is good recommendation, but then it's those 10% of the time when they recommend something which I don't agree, right? My kid enjoy watching whatever is showing up, right? They have a fun time, right? As a parent, I, sometimes I don't agree, right? So it's kind of like in the context of responsible AI, who is there to making sure your kid has the right information as they grow up, right? And so once in a while as a player and I look over their shoulder just to see what they are watching, are they making good decision? If not, tell them about why this is not maybe the best selection of the uh, movie or, or video that you should be watching and, and how can we guide them to uh, make the better decision, right? So in the context about uh, AI application in our industry, exactly like that, right? So especially for the data scientists, uh, Gray mentioned the unicorn, right? They are a population of the professional data scientists who understand the, the math behind AI and understanding that uh, uh, the risk that is associated to high, medium, and low, right? And and that, that's why in terms of uh, how do we trust AI, right? Because like I said, AI has scale mean that everybody, everybody will have a way to interact with AI, right? And what kind of guardrail we need to uh, put it there? And what, what is the governance structure you need to making sure that at the company like DAO and in our industry, that needs to be happening. Just to add one more, or totally agree, Leo, uh, and, and I think regulation is certainly, that's a whole separate webinar. Um, but but the, the, the one thing I add is trustworthy can mean a lot of things. Is the intent good? And then can you believe it? I mean, you know, a good AI should surface things that a, a normal scientist might not have come up with on their own. And we see that happen not infrequently. Um, and so the other thing is having an AI that can explain itself. Why do you think this would be true? And then actually go testing it. And then look, we're all scientists here. The proof is in the pudding. If you tell me something's going to turn out in one way and over time you're right more than you're wrong, you become trustworthy. And if you are always wrong, then you lose trust. And that's just sort of straightforward, whether it's a human or a computer. Um, people will see that the results get better and get better and better over time. And, and that builds trust too. Great to hear you guys' perspective on this. We have time for one more question before moving on to the audience Q&A. So Greg, you kind of touched up on this earlier, but can you share some successful and unsuccessful examples in regards to AI and scalability? For example, what are some best practices and on the flip side, bad practices? And are there any common traps and pitfalls to watch out for? Yeah, so so the the... The metaphor I like to use, which probably a little bit shows my age, is um, is is Fred Flintstone. You know, he's uh, a, a company is sort of shaped like Fred Flintstone, right? especially a big one. You know, looks 
kind of lumbering. You know, he doesn't look particularly uh, doesn't look particularly light on his feet. And then he goes bowling and he's twinkle toes. Right. For those of you who might remember that cartoon, I think of of this as entering an era where the chemicals companies um, have traditionally been conservative, slow movers. And for good reason, right? You're, you're spending billions of dollars on a plant. You have to work that thing very efficiently to get the, the investment back out. And at the same time, AI is bringing this totally new world in of rapid change, massive agility, learning constantly. And, and the difference between a company that is successful and that isn't is one that doesn't say, we are going to just make AI happen and come up with one you know, Gantt charted plan and they just follow it blindly. I've seen that happen and I've seen it not work. Where I see the best capabilities is where someone starts with a couple of projects, never just one, and then you're betting everything on one small project, do two or three projects, see some initial results, learn about what data you need, where things work well, where they don't, what culture you need to change, and then continue to grow. And I've seen that work consistently time and time again. And it helps if some of those early projects are doing things that would be hard for a regular scientist. So in, in practical terms, we've seen folks formulate out things like PFAS and other toxic chemicals very, very quickly using AI. We've seen folks go through cost engineering exercises, which if you're an industry now, you know, is a challenging thing to do. Um, we've seen folks really gain margin by reducing cost. And we've also seen folks improve performance in ways that were unexpected um, it, pretty, pretty directly. And so in each of these cases, a scientist can say, look, this AI helped me do this really important thing that would have been sort of known to be hard. And we did it in a small bite. Now we're taking a bigger bite and a bigger bite and a bigger bite. And so now we're institutionalizing it because uh, otherwise you end up with these five and 10 year plans and nobody's willing to change them as you learn. And the reality is this industry is changing. The industry and the AI is changing so quickly that we can't define today what success seven years from now looks like. But what we can say is we can put ourselves on a learning curve that we can adapt to what it looks like in seven years. Yeah, so this is, one of the topic that I've been thinking a lot and a couple of years ago, I started to give a uh, half day kind of uh, data science workshop in different conferences, right? So, so the thesis of the uh, workshop is about like practices. What do we learn about the whole AI journey? What is a successful use case and successful use case and what is the recommendation, right? So the latest workshop that I gave, I, I have the uh, top 10 with and truth to summarize, I think everything that we talk about in the talk, obviously I'm not gonna, I have enough time to talk about the uh, top 10 points that uh, I have learned over the uh, career, right? But I just talk about the top two, right? One is I heard a lot, meaning that uh, the more data means better model, right? And go collect more data, go collect more experimental data and go get more simulation data. And, but not necessary at, at the end, uh, it's really about the quality of the data really matter. And, and uh, so this is something that I have, couple of use cases to talk about what I learned uh, in some of my projects and to the point that uh, literally I spent like a couple of months to uh, do a model using everything that I could think of and do all this outline detection algorithm I'm trying to figure out is it the outlines or is, is it because we don't have the right uh, uh, variable in, in the system at the end it's really the data quality issue so we figure out we just do a simple design experiment to collect the right data and then that project finished in a couple of weeks because of the right data so the second point that we hear a lot is really uh, what we feel for a company laid out and, and we have a lot of historical data and that's what we need to build a robust data science model. That is partially true, by the way. That's, that's why as I introduced my uh, um, journey in AI, that is exactly what I started in terms of taking advantage of the historical data. But the question you got to ask yourself when your historical data is not sufficient uh, for your uh, project, what do you do next, right? And that is really uh, interesting. Or well, also learn this data when your model is uh, uh, all this project with a data science model, the end users never meet somebody else, it's a stakeholder. How are they gonna use the, the model to make the decision? What is the, how good is good enough for the model? And and uh, so uh, uh, if your historical data is not enough, the question become how can we generate the additional data with a full simulation or experiment? Or is it because like uh, they are physics, and uh, fundamental knowledge we should incorporate into the, uh, into the model. This is what we call a uh, hybrid modeling uh, framework. It's something that we also invested in a uh, couple of years ago, right? Is it because we don't have the right uh, representation of the data, feature engineering, or sometimes descriptor? So how can we have the right description of data, transform the data so that we can do the uh, machine learning model, right? And, and so these are all the kind of like the learning uh, 
uh, to summarize about different kind of BSS model and, and what can we really uh, uh, um, continue to invest in the uh, AI and data science journey. Thank you, Leo and Greg. Now we'll be moving on to the questions from the audience. So one of the first questions that came in, uh, energy industry requires expertise in physics, chemistry, electrical, chemical, and mechanical engineering. How can AI affect each or all divisions of energy science? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be quick about this one. Um, look, I think that one of the powers of AI is that AI connects really well to other AI. Um, you know, it's, it's all computers. We have APIs. What, what historically took um, someone to, you know, get a bunch of people from different disciplines in a room to hash out all the interfaces among all these challenges, now you can do a little bit more systematically. And, and this is this is something that's really powerful. Uh, you know, when we think about uh, not specifically in energy, but well, I'll, I'll give an example there. You have a transformer design. Great. That's, you know, and, and there's some electrical engineer that knows that you have power, uh, power inverters and things on the transformer. That's a different kind of electrical engineer. You have the semiconductor folks who make those things. Those are materials people and, and transistor design folks. And you have the fundamental materials researchers, and those all need to work together. And traditionally, that's been extremely serial and has taken place over decades. And AI is not going to take decades and make it months, but it might take decades and make it a couple of years because you can better interconnect the learnings among those length scales such that you can actually get to know what the effect of a particular change very low down has on the overall transformer design. But it gets back to my point around collaboration. The AI can connect, the AI can smooth those connections, but it's not going to remove the need for collaboration, at least not in the near term, um, among those, those technical experts who ultimately need to sign off on the designs of these things. Yeah, so so the question, the energy industry or chemical industry, material industry or manufacturing industry in general have a very similar kind of attribute, right? So we are a lot of different domain expertise, either in physics, chemistry or engineering of different kind, right? And, so uh, how can we AI impact all? So this is back to like, uh, how do we scale the AI? We are a citizen data scientist, right? And so in the conference today, we have actually a couple of presentation talk about exactly just that as not as, as a classical trained data science, as a citizen data scientist. So we, we have a uh, CFD example of those who understand computation fluent dynamics, right? And, and talk many times a lot of computation power to build to the model that you need for your project purpose, right? And and then machine learning offer a really good circuit opportunity to really bring in the uh, data aspect to really speed up the uh, uh, the safety development, right? So we have a use case to talk about that. Right? And, and so a lot of time also in, in the project that I have worked with, right? A lot of time, like the, um, we have a lot of these uh, fundamental model, kinetic model that we develop in the lab scale. And, and then uh, it took a long time to take the lab scale kinetic model to uh, make it work for a manufacturing scale chemistry that we are practicing. And and, uh, and then this is, on the other hand, if you think about manufacturing, we have a lot of historical data, but a lot of time, the way we want the assets is about we try to make our plan to be a steady state, right? So this is another opportunity we are seeing in a hybrid model and to bring the lab scale kind of a kinetic model that we've been developing to the plant data who explain uh, how we operate, right? And, and this is one of our first kind of a reinforcement learning kind of a use case that we demonstrated a couple of years ago, right? So the opportunity is really endless, right? That, that, that's why the best way for uh, all your expertise in physics, chemistry, electrical engineering, understanding what is a robot in terms of the uh, model that relevant to them, right? What kind of data they can collect, what kind of machine learning can, can be used to help and speed up the way they uh, uh, do project. Thank you. Another question from the audience that we have, what are the specific kinds of problems or use cases that you have seen AI work really well with? Most of the success stories I have seen are in formulation optimization. Are there similar success stories for different types of problems like chemical process development? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I can give a quick answer there. It, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's really across the, spe the spectrum. We've seen molecule design. Um, we've seen process development and optimization, particularly process robustness optimization. So how do you actually make a process that that has uh, a sufficient degree of, it can absorb a certain amount of variability before it actually goes off the rails, which is very important for large scale production and then formulation. Um, and, and also in hard materials, similar stories there. 
the reason you've seen more formulation stories is for there's a couple but the primary one is that formulation is very close to the market if you're trying to make a new molecule you've got to make the molecule test the molecule then scale the molecule up then figure out what you use the molecule for there's a long path and so it's not that it's not being used for that it's just that the results take longer to get to uh for something you can buy in your local walgreens or wherever you're whatever the thing is you're trying to buy wherever you buy it um so so we've seen success across the board but but formulation tends to be the tip of the spear in terms of commercial outcomes so great talk a lot about the formulation for the development this is exactly uh, uh kind of like the low-hanging fruit so to speak we see a lot of success in our industry so I'm going to talk very briefly about process development, new especially for new product development, what is the role for AI, right? So back to the point about like we've been applying AI for a long time. And, and uh, so we have a lot of uh, experience to think about how do we use uh, math modeling optimization framework to uh, really design plan and suggest how all this configuration, uh, because as a chemical engineer, you have a lot of technology in terms of how you design the reactor. And then once you have the product, how do you separate them? There are a lot of different separation technology and then the math modeling framework we have decade or experience. And, but then in terms of like, what is the role for AI then, right? And in terms of private modeling is something that we, we saw also opportunity about like, uh, 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 if we can quickly generate a lot of different uh, plant design scenario, what if scenario, how can we quickly uh, really go to the uh, global optimal design, right? And that, that's why the circuit modeling are producing new that will really help us to speed up on that kind of uh, screening perspective, right? In some of the recent conference, right, I, I think some of the top will talk about what is the role for the last language model in terms of uh, uh, bringing out a spreadsheet and deciding a plant, right? Those I must say is uh, interesting, but definitely not mature in terms of that can reduce your practice, right? Because a lot of time, like, uh, uh, where do they get the data to train the uh, large language model or generative AI models based on public data or information, which is very limited in terms of detailed plan design, right? So, so they don't, most of the PNID is internal to the company, you lock it for you is a proprietary information, right? So when, when, when the model is trying to give a suggestion and if you are the uh, process engineer, you're probably gonna laugh at that. I will never decide plan like that, right? But this, those are the opportunity that uh, as, as the researcher start to have the more meaningful kind of data that they can use. And that's where you, you start to see more excitement or development the AI for the process design. Thank you. Another question that we have. So going back to the scaling up comment, what does the commitment in people, time, and other resources need to be to implement AI and see the initial results of 50 to 70% reduction in experiments? Second part of what is the time and resource needed for getting to the steady state 90% reduction? Yeah, so so I, I can uh, your mileage may vary. This there is no there is no strict answer here. But uh, the rule of thumb I like to use for a company that is just starting on their AI journey is that within a single project, um, if this is your full time project, uh, it's about twenty percent time. Um, to to work on learning these these new skills. In our case, it will be using our platform, um, but about ten hours a week. Um, and and then of course you have time for experiments and actually running the rest of the project. That reduces over time for two reasons. One is you get better at building these models and sort of knowing what you do, right? You just gain efficiency. The second is we recommend reusing models. It turns out if you're an adhesives company and you make an adhesive model, your future project is also an adhesive model. And so as long as you're not totally changing chemistries, there's a lot of times portability there. Um, so, so it's usually the first project or two uh, is kind of 10 hours a week. And then beyond that, we see the number come down. Um, and that 90%, you really just achieve by being better at using the system. So it's less that you need a ton more time. And it's more, you just learn the tricks of the trade, what works well in your space, what data you need. Um, you become better at using things more, more facile. Uh, and so it's, uh, I would say it's not a substantially larger investment. It's just the aggregate experience over time to get to that 90% reduction. Yeah, so I agree with Grace. It's very difficult to put a specific reduction, right? But I also want to reframe the question about a lot of time is not about how much time you can save on experiment. It's really how can you improve the quality of a decision you can get? How can you do smarter experiment to collect a data point that's critical for your machine learning model, for example, right? And and uh, so in a very traditional sense, right? And we've been 
practicing design experience concept in the company for many decades, actually. And, and uh, so that continues to be really deep in our uh, research mindset about how, like, how do we design experiment, right? And between machine learning development, there are a lot of uh, uh, advancement in terms of using active learning or vision optimization, right? And the vision optimization, active learning, designed to really reduce the number of experiments. So there are a lot of uh, kind of internal kind of uh, uh, competitive study to see like given an objective what you want to accomplish right and what is the role for traditional kind of DOE versus the uh, active learning approach right which is better for work kind of uh, project and, and, and problem right and and uh, so I think this is something that um, uh, uh, doing smart experiments is, is important and and then the other point a lot of time we talk about uh, data quality and, and uh, generating experiment that you need to um uh to build your model right and and uh, so one of the things that I I um also want to emphasize is that uh, uh when you go look at all these journal paper most of the time or in academia in general right and you likely only gonna report your successful experiment result and and that's how you get a journal publication right when things don't work and you rarely actually publish there or uh, advertise uh, your failure, right? But in, in a R&D kind of setting, right, when things don't work, those are also a very important data for us to understand and learn, right? And, and that's why back to the uh, voice of secret sauce about our collective kind of expertise experience for things that is working also for experiment that didn't work out what we learn from there, right? And that's, that, that's why it's, uh, even though there are a lot of excitement and, and development especially in generative AI, right, to Make it work in the uh, industry and our company is really about this uh, internal know-how and and uh, so I do agree about like uh, uh, we should have a very focused effort about how to how best to design experiment to collect the uh, data to maximize information. Thank you. Now let's squeeze one more audience question in. Uh, what should be the purpose of a project involving both chemistry and AI, advancement of chemistry or AI? I, I would argue that they they sort of come up together. Uh, we will learn how to use AI in chemistry better as we do more chemistry-focused projects using AI. Uh, with that said, the cutting edge of AI, for, for my deep love of chemistry and the innovative stuff we're doing, the cutting edge of AI is actually not in chemistry. The cutting edge of AI is going to be demonstrated in places where there's a lot larger data, uh, that data is publicly available, and there's a tremendous amount to be learned there. And then we're going to take those technologies and apply them to chemistry by understanding how they're used in other areas. So um, I don't think, you know, you, you don't have sort of the AI, there are AI leaders at many companies, but the, the really, really breakthrough AI stuff uh, is being brought into chemistry from other domains um, and, and not so much, you know, most large chemical companies are not generate, you know, spending a billion dollars to, to train an LLM in chemistry. That's not the common model. There may be some that do that, but that's not going to be the, the primary way the AI is driven forward. So my, my quick answer is sometimes you heard the term autonomous lab, right? So I can streamline the experimental process, right? What is the role of automation and can really streamline some of this workflow, right? When you have a streamlined workflow, you can start to think about like uh, uh, how you can, back to the part, how do you design an experiment that is really maximizing the information generation. And once you have the data being generated from the lab, right, how can you have a systematic way to store the data, including the metadata, how you collect data and, and to the point that build up the data that we need, right? the term we use in DAO is the data foundation. And, and uh, um, so, so th those are really the uh, um, uh, important aspect in terms of AI for chemistry. Thank you. So we're nearing the end of our panel discussion today. Leo, Greg, I'd like to open the floor to you guys if you have any final remarks you'd like to make. Yeah, so I, I, I'll start to close about what does it take to AI at scale, right? We are definitely on the right path, right? And going into the future, what do we need is continue to be AI, human working in the loop, right? And responsible AI is something that I'm really passionate about as we get for a doctor, making sure that the uh, uh, model developer, the model user, everybody understand how to use it in a very responsible way. Yeah, I, I guess I would I would agree with Leo. You know, really thank you everyone for being here and for the discussion. I, I think the the uh, there are two things that I'd like to to leave behind. One is AI is is going to be 
a, a huge advantage for the people who use it and use it well and who scale it properly. It, there, there's no doubt about that. How you do that affects a lot of things. And uh, what we have seen is there was a phase where everybody was trying to build AI internally. Only a number of, only a small number of companies were able to do that um, because it just takes tremendous scale and investment. And, and it's not the thing uh, that most companies, most chemical companies are really, really good at. Um, we, my, my recommendation is work with best in class. You know, we, we certainly talk about ourselves that way. Um, the other thing is, the know-how and the knowledge you have internally about your own chemistries is going to be the differentiator for your company going forward. There are going to be startups in chemistry that claim they're doing AI. There are going to be competitors emerging all over the place using these new models. And what you as an industrial operator or an academic operator have is your historical knowledge around the space. And so your ability to, to leverage that to stay ahead of everybody else is really critical. And, and capturing that knowledge, data, and expertise um, is the difference between sort of a naive system and one that that is is a true differentiated competitive advantage for for anyone in any area of science and so um so i i'm i really appreciative of, of having the opportunity here um it's been a real pleasure leo thank you uh, melanie thank you for for moderating uh and and i look forward to uh discussions with anyone on the line uh who might be interested in talking you you can uh find find our website at citrine.io but always happy to chat and thank you very much thank you too so much for the wonderful dialogue that you presented us with and with that, we will be concluding our discussion for today. Thank you for joining us on our webinar on AI plus scalability, and I hope you all have a good rest of your day.